Um, Phil Lubacic asks about other parts of rowing's ecosystem. So, um, you know, we focused on clubs. We haven't really talked so much about events mm -hmm. um, and their capacity for income generation. A lot of club, a lot of events here would, would you know, the money would go, be run by clubs and go back mm -hmm. into the clubs. Um, yeah, well, again, you know, that I think that's a that's a question of increase broadening the public appeal through the growth of the clubs, privatizing the clubs. Spectator sports are most popular when the spectators know what's going on, right? Um, so, you, you know, you look at American football, for example. Why is American football so big in the United States? Well, you know, as a high school sport, it's huge. Almost every single high school in the United States is offering some type of high, uh, football program, right? So you have all these young men for the last... 70 80 years been coming through football so they know what it is they can watch the game they understand what's happening they empathize with the athletes um when you get a rowing competition a lot of people don't don't know what's happening right they see the boats go by you know what what's happening i don't know um i think you know things like the technology the drone the the the, the you know the online streaming has gone a long way to, to to help that along but i still think um there's a, a lack of understanding in the public of what they're looking at. So if you increase access, if you get more people doing it as a natural byproduct of that, you're going to have more people interested in watching it happen at a very, very high level. You know, and, then, and that's what we're talking about in terms of professional rowing, <clears throat> competitions, events, sponsorships. But I think the key thing is we need to improve access. We need to um, invest in these clubs as private organizations, broaden the public appeal, and then and then the rest will follow. I know one of the things you've been critical of clubs f for not doing has been engaging on social media, and particularly something like Facebook ads. Uh, <laughs> which, yeah. Um, yeah where, where, where did that stem from? Well, you know, it, it, it's, uh, again, my wife, the genius, right? So she's a professional marketer. Um, and, uh, you know, she works, uh, she's, she's a, uh, works for a toy company. Uh, and so she's a VP of uh, marketing at a toy company. So she's constantly thinking about how to get her message out there and digital media, online, social networks is definitely the way to go. Old media, you know, newspaper flyers and, and, uh, television that is definitely down, down on the decline. And if you think about. Uh, platforms like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, that's where that's where people are flocking for their content now. So I think, you know, for rowing clubs, um, you know, I, I don't think there's a single rowing club where that would say, well, we're not, you know, everybody's got an Instagram account, everybody's got a Facebook ac account, but they're using that internally, right? So it's mostly just for members to share pictures and, you know, uh, complimenting people and sometimes complaining. Um, nobody's really using it to, to, to advertise their learn to row session or come down to the club and, and do learn to row. And that's something that I've definitely been, that's, that's been a lot of my business the last six months is working with clubs and broadening their, uh, their, their online appeal by actually advertising on these sites like Facebook, Instagram, and, and uh, uh, YouTube. Right. And here's the thing that blows my mind. It's so inexpensive. Right. You know, you can drop 15, 20, 30 dollars on an Instagram ad and reach thousands of people in your community. It's targeted and you can pick the age that you want to target. You can pick gender. You can, you know, people that are interested in outside activities. And every time I've engaged a club in this, they've seen so much response that they're like, they're just, oh my God, I never would have thought this actually works. But yeah, there's so many people on these social media sites now that, you know, they're not, they're not watching television. They're not seeing the ads on television anymore. And who can afford that, right? And why would yeah. you want to? Because, you know, you could put an ad on TV and have it be seen by millions of people, but only 500 of them care, right? You advertise on social media you can target 
thousands of people and you know that of those thousands of people, 90% are actually really, really interested in what you're, what you're advertising about. And so I think, I think, yeah, that's, um, using social media to monetize what the club's doing. Um, you know, and that's a step further for, you know, beyond just raising the dues for a club, you know, how about developing the club's brand, finding right. ways. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, um, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt there. I was yeah. just, a, just agreeing with you. Um, uh, um, in, in terms of, uh, I, I know some of the stuff that you you talked about as as you know, been in, encourage clubs to actually say that this is the salary we we pay for coaches. I, mm -hmm. I know in in your article about rowing a zero and zero billion dollar industry, uh, you know, if we talk about the volunteers, there's there's so many volunteers in the sport. Do you think yeah. that 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 ought to be monetized by the clubs? They ought to be paying a salary for for people to volunteer so the actual cost of the sport is is real and yeah. covered yeah or, I, where, where do you stand on that john yeah i 100 uh, percent agree i mean you know okay so it's a little bit selfish i'm a i'm a full-time professional coach and i'd love to make more money doing what i'm doing um but i also think that if you you know volunteer coaches and some of them have been doing it for a very, very long time. And, and some of them are outstanding coaches, no doubt, right? Uh, you know, the fact that they're not paid, I don't want to take that away from what they're doing. Um, but I think the more opportunity you have for an individual to be compensated for their time, they're going to want to invest more into that. So the skill of those coaches, as we pay them more, is naturally going to go up. You're going to have more coaches thinking about um, you know, what they're doing on a day to day basis, planning it, you know, if they, if they have a, a, um, a compens compensatory, and uh, opportunity, um, to improve their skill set, they're absolutely going to want to do that. I mean, that's to me is a, is a no brainer. I wanted to become a better coach, not because I just wanted to win races, but because I wanted it to be my career. Right. And so, you know, if I, I need a living wage if I'm going to, if it's going to be my career, right. I need to be able to support myself and, and potentially even support my family. Um, so I think that, yeah, the more we invest in paying the professionals, not just the coaches, but administrators, things like that, um, the more quality of experience we're going to see within the sport. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a few points um, that the people have raised. Uh, Luff Ryan talks about uh, masters rowing as a, maybe a cash rich <laughs> community. I know you mentioned about Marin, uh, Marin Boat Club there with yeah. I know, a very strong masters rowing community. Right. right. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree. I think masters are definitely the untapped. Uh, market potential within clubs. You know, there's been a lot of, in the United States, there's been a lot of focus on the junior market. And, um, you know, again, I, I feel like sometimes this, this conversation is a little too cynical, but, um, but yeah, you know, there's definitely a feeling like we need to soak the juniors. Right. And, um, and I think that it, there's so much more opportunity for growth. I mean, there's opportunity for growth and the, the, for junior rowing. But um, I would agree with uh, uh, with this question that I think, um, you know, masters rowers, um, there's a lot of opportunity for financial growth there. And, and let's let's be fair too, right? Like, let's offer a better experience. Like their point is they get ignored or neglected. Um, I don't see why a master's rower should not be um, ushered into an outstanding on the water experience, you know, because they're they're older. I, I mean, I don't, or, I don't know. I don't understand that. Right. Um, you know, I think, you know, I would even go a step further and say, why aren't we structuring master's teams the same way we're structuring youth teams? Right. I, <laughs> this is going to be controversial. I don't think you need to be there every day in order to put together a quality crew that can be competitive. Right. I think the fitness and the training comes first. And that can happen at home now with the rowing machines and home fitness centers. And now like everybody's doing that anyway. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think you can put together a quality crew that rows, you know, three, two, maybe, you know, once a week, 
once a week, right? Like, I think that's, that, that's okay. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Masters rowing should, uh, we should have more investment into that. Um, Adrian, Adrian Casti has asked in terms of some of the changes you've spoken about, John, um, you know, thinking, uh, sort of turning thinking is on its head. Who's, who's going to frustrate that process and, and what have they got to lose? Oh, the people that don't want to pay more, right? Look at this, nobody wants to pay more, right? Yes. Me, do I want my, my, you know, I belong to a gym. I belong to a fitness center. Like, do I want my rates to go up? No, of course not. Um, but I think, uh, you know, and I don't think it needs to be a, a missionary cell to make that happen. Um, I think that, you know, you just need to do the math, put the numbers out and not just for this year's budget for, but for the budget five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Right. Uh, and make the case for like, at least we need inflationary raises on dues every year. Um, and we're not going to be able to pay for a new roof if we don't have, you know, some savings, um, you know, 10, you know, in place 10 years down the road. So, um, so I think, yeah, I think there's going to be some legacy players that really, really push against that, but, um, you know, we got to move forward. We got to move forward. Um, I know another thing that you've you've written and, and spoken about, which is kind of all linked in with this, is um, that 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 clubs could do far more to actively recruit rowers who come out of college than they do. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to eye roll, but yes, <laughs> yeah, you know, and I think um, that's uh, you know, particularly in the United States, that's a problem. Um, you know, we have athletes coming out of the high school level, coming out of the collegiate level, and they just walk away. And why is that? Yeah. And, um, it's still a question I'm, I'm trying to answer. I think the, the, easy, the easy cynical answer is that they're burned out. Um, but I, I, I think I don't think there's a, a tradition for, for that. I think... Here's a thought, you know, it's a little bit more proactive. Why aren't clubs actively recruiting, right? So you live in a community with a rowing club. Uh, presumably you have some commercial industry there, or jobs to be had. Um, you know, why not enable those athletes to come to your club, participate, um, you know, maybe uh, open a pipeline or network into job opportunities in the area? Um, you know, why, why not? You know, or maybe incidentally, they move to the area and then they're looking for a place to row. Like, again, that's where the social media comes in. Everybody between the ages of 13 and 30 has an Instagram account at this point um, using social media platforms to advertise specifically to that constituency would help that along. Yeah. Do you think rowing sometimes doesn't do itself a favor because, you know, I, I'm thinking of, you know, my own daughters, she rowed at university. She's just gone back to a club now. Um, and, um, and it's kind of like, if you go back, you have to do the whole program. So the whole program lasts, you know, is, is, I don't know, uh, eight, six, seven, eight training sessions a week. You know, she's got a job. People have jobs. Do you think that kind of, it puts people off getting involved in rowing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, I think we have to, um, I think a lot of clubs will, they, they introduce a certain amount of rigidness into their structure, which again is a turn, can be a turnoff for people like, okay, you can't be a part of this team unless you're here five days a week. Right. Well, okay. That's everybody would admit that can be pretty challenging for a professional. Right. Um, so I think, you know, it's like the standing shove in the single, right? Like why, that may look cool and that may raise the standard for your club, which may have a certain appeal for you, but it definitely becomes exclusive and it keeps people out. So I think, you know, and it feeds into the master's question as well. Um, you know, why introduce these restrictions on membership when, you know, there's some debate about whether or not, that precludes being competitive. Like if we were to talk about the competitive question in the United States, we have virtual rowing clubs, which are, they don't exist in a facility. That's just, you know, they call them, sometimes they call them Rolodex clubs, right? It's just a group of athletes that they train on their own and then they get together and they compete and they do very well. Mm. Right. And so you can't, 
based on that, you can't argue to me that, okay, everybody needs to be there six, seven days a week in order to be competitive. Um, I, you know, I, I think the training and the fitness comes first and then, you know, getting people to row well together, uh, can come after that. Um, something around around government's involvement is there any way do you see a role for any state or federal government in the states for this i, I know in, in terms of rowing in the uk uh, there's a lot of money coming into the international side of the sport and my own club Molesy boat club has you know funds from the international program to to run you know junior and and, and senior coaches there so there is money coming in from the center to clubs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think there's a role for, for federal or state governments in the U.S.? Uh, that's a, you know, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, maybe that falls into more of a healthcare umbrella, right? Like I personally would, I, you know, I go to the gym every day. I would love to get a discount on my health insurance <laughs> if, if I could, uh, if I could demonstrate to them that I'm a healthy individual and I'm going to be low maintenance. Right. Um, you know, so I, 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 you know, whether this, the, the state, or federal government should play a role in that. Um, I, I don't know. I think maybe that's that's sort of a larger political question that I'm not in a position to answer. Um, yeah. But, uh, but you know, I as a as an active person, I would love to be rewarded for taking care of myself, being fit, being healthy, um, and incentivized to do that. Yeah. What. John, where, where does this go now? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to call it a campaign, although it mm -hmm. might look, look a bit like a campaign if you look back at your LinkedIn profile. Um, where does this campaign or where does this process go for you now? Um, you know, I, I, yeah, campaign may be, um, may be too strong a word. I think I'm, you know, advocacy. advocacy. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to continue to, to advocate for this um you know, for this direction for community. Um, you know, I had a conversation with somebody that um, actually works for a for-profit rowing club. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and he says he's been um, uh, apostolizing. Is that the right word? Um, yeah. he's, 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 you know, he's been, he has been campaigning uh, for this type because he's working at a club where it's working. Um, and I, in fact, I would go so far to say that if you were to find you know, it's not many of them, but if you were to find the four profit clubs that are out there, you would actually find that they're doing very, very well. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm going to continue to, 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 to advocate for this. I mean, you know, for to the uh, debatable interest of your viewers, I'm going to, <laughs> for obvious reasons, I'm going to focus on uh, domestic United States. But, um, but yeah, you know, it's something that we need to continue to talk about, you know, and I'll put it out there. Maybe there's a entrepreneurial um, opportunity for someone that wants to uh, be not just the advocate, but the actual broker of a helping clubs transition from nonprofit to pro to private. Um, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily in the cards for me, but uh, someone with the right connections, the right understanding the laws around that transition, uh, maybe an attorney or uh, in having knowledge of the, the financial backers that would be willing to invest in something like that. I don't know how, how up you are in, in terms of the international side of the sport mm -hmm. or the changes in the Olympic program, but one of the questions here is around um, the introduction of coastal rowing to the Olympics. I don't know if that's going to make any sizable difference to any of your ideas or um, it's a well, way... Yeah, I think uh, it's a it's a great question. You know, um, compare it to the, the the surfing, right? So one of the reasons surfing is such a popular sport, and you know, in in, in Southern California here, uh, we have thousands of these guys that have a van full of surfboards, and they they rent out and they just show up at the beach, and they rent out surfboards and they give lessons on the spot. And so I think, yeah, coastal rowing could be an outstanding opportunity for someone with a pickup truck and a trailer for full of learn to row or coastal boats just to you know put people in the surf and teach them how to row and, and make that accessible yeah i think that's absolutely a viable business model on a smaller scale but 
for a one for one or two people a family business i think that's a great uh it's a great opportunity mm-hmm. and you know one thing which I, I thought of asking you really um is around international rowing because the american program i think Historically, it's so well funded in some of the big schools in the U.S., but international mm-hmm. rowing is is completely not funded in that way, and um, I think struggles. Is, is yeah. that something you're across, or you've got a view on? Uh, you know, I, I'm peripherally aware of it. I don't, you know, I'll be completely candid and say that I'm not. Uh, I don't rate that high. I'm not. I don't really work in those circles that much. Um, but but um, but yeah, you know, I think I. Uh, I read a really fat, this is a number of years ago, but, um, you know, one of these athletes that was blogging made the point that she felt more supported at a collegiate program, the, the division one collegiate program she wrote at than as a, uh, multi, uh, you know, multi Olympics, uh, athlete, right. That's been training for, you know, a couple of different, or a couple, uh, couple of cycles at this point. So, um, yeah, you know, I will always say that we need to support our elite level athletes, um, to as much as we can. I'll, you know, always advocate for that. I think the wonderful thing about elite athletes is they show what our potential capacity is as human beings are. Like, that's the most amazing thing about those athletes is they really, you know, it's, it's entertaining, obviously, to watch the competition and the racing, but they are showing they're demonstrating what we are capable of as a species and pushing those boundaries. And that's, that's a huge value, right? It's just as much as we have, we have our, uh, uh, you know, our, our highest rated intellectuals pushing the, 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 the boundaries of, of human development, human intellectual development. And we have these Olympic athletes pushing the boundaries of, you know, how fast a muscle can fire, you know, mm-hmm. how efficient a capillary can work. I mean, that's, that's incredibly valuable. And I guess I guess one thing that's come through, and uh, you know, w- which I and many people listening would share with you is an absolute love of this very unique sport of rowing and, and right. what it can give, what it has given us and what it can give to people, which is kind of why I guess we're so passionate about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, and again, the, you know, I want to sort of hopefully uh, offer some defense that it's, you know, the, the, my perspective may come across as a little bit cynical, but I think, you know, ultimately it's for the growth of the sport and broadening its appeal and getting, you know, what we do is just, it's amazing. It's amazing, right? Like the, the rowing motion is so perfect, right? Like we've been executing this motion since the moments we stood up on our hind legs. It's the most basic human motion, right? Even before we were running, we were standing up on our hind legs and that is the rowing motion, right? And to be able to do that on the water is just, it's just an amazing feeling. And the more people that can experience that, the better. Yeah. John, uh, you know, that might, that might be a, a good place to draw things to a close. I just wonder if, you know, we, we've ranged far and wide, if there's anything perhaps that we haven't covered or, or talked about that would be. No, you know, I'm, 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 you know, full of gratitude for the conversation. You know, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to to talk about this. And and um, yeah, great questions from everybody. And uh, I always love a good conversation about rowing, right? Yeah. And and where can people get in touch with you and connect with you if they want to, John? So I'm primarily on LinkedIn. Uh, I also have an Instagram feed, which I you know I, I post something on there <clears throat> every day. But um, the best uh, best place for me to work is is LinkedIn. And, uh, and I, you know, just a little plug, I will say, if you are a a professional or hoping to work in the sport of rowing, I would make sure that you are on LinkedIn because that is, um, that is absolutely the place, uh, to make things happen. Yeah. I did read a a very good article that you, you wrote on LinkedIn. You can, you can go back on LinkedIn and look at Mm -hmm. John's articles and and that's another good article, which is, uh, not just for rowing coaches, I think for everybody to, yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Martin. I really appreciate it. Thanks, John. Well, we'll end the live part of this broadcast now and and say thank you very much, John uh, Vojkovic. You've been an absolute star chatting and uh, made the last hour of our lives all all more rich. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you.